Eves, thanks so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I am blown away by you. You are uh, a musician, a model, an activist. You uh, volunteer at homeless shelters and um, uh, volunteer at uh, runaway centers. You rescue pit bulls. I mean, I'm inspired. Uh, what I guess my first question is like, where does this passion to help others come from? I would say that the bulk of it stems from knowing what it's like to not be helped and knowing what it's like to be in a place where you can't really find someone who cares. And a lot of the times, um, even outside care could have a greater impact than care from someone you know. And so volunteering and taking the time to uh, use my time for other people is, I think, the least that I could do as a human. So when was a time in your life that you felt like you needed outside help or somebody to even just show compassion towards you that, you, that wasn't there? I mean, I'm only 25, <clears throat> but a good, like, 10 years maybe, like, of me transitioning from, like, a toddler into <clears throat> preteen and also a teenager as well. It was just really rough and, um, I had personal issues with my family, and I felt like I wasn't really being heard or taken seriously. And so I took a lot of matters into my own hands because it was the only thing I had control of at the time. I knew that eventually, somehow, some way, it was going to lead into me possibly like, either taking a life or taking my own life just because of what was happening to me uh, during that time. So would you say that you felt extreme, extremely lonely, extremely angry, extreme, uh, invisible? Like what were some of the feelings that you felt and what were, how were you, I guess self-soothing would be the, the question I have because I think as, I think most teenagers, they either look for a friend, a mentor, um, uh, they try to numb out with TV or, right. or you know, whatever they can find. You talk about your, your issues with drug abuse. Yeah. Clearly that's how your, your first mode of healing. Right. What was it, the feeling that drove you towards that? And then when did you start to see that it was uh, ineffective and wasn't actually healing the part of you that was hurting? Well, yeah, I, I, during that time, <clears throat> I guess I was feeling that, not guess, I, I was, I was filling that void with drugs and drinking a lot and going to parties and doing pretty reckless things. And I didn't really see how much it was not working until um, I would say the first year of me being clean or reflecting on that time that I was using. But even in the mix of that, I had friends who were dying um, from overdoses and drunk driving and just being in the wrong place. And sadly, even then, I still wasn't convinced to stop. And I persisted and continued on to use even more um, because I, I didn't want to face the, the challenges of having to <clears throat> have a new friendship. Or even deal with the, the feelings of loss. Right, or you... to be in someone else's life. Um, because I, I also at the time felt like a burden to those around me and didn't really want to bother anybody with the weight of what I was carrying and put that on anyone else. Because even just for me, I felt like it was too much, and the only thing I could turn to was this temporary fix. But the more I used, the uh, the harder it was for me to get high, because my body had become so used to certain drugs that I was kind of just, at that point, just playing with death, just constantly pushing the limit to how much I could do and how much I could take and how high I could get. And um, it, it definitely was, uh, for me at the time, the only thing that could help and the only thing that I felt, I found any kind of solace or um, grounding in was using. 
So what was the moment that changed for you? What, you know, you talk about losing people in your life, you talk about it having to do more and more for it to even be effective for you, but at what point you teach yourself with very little knowledge of how to take care of yourself. Right. And then eventually you learn that it's, it's, it's not helping you the way you thought it would or it's not filling the void that you, you hoped it would. So what was the moment or the realization, what changed you from going from, this is how I'm gonna take care of myself to this seems like a better way to take care of myself? Well, I got clean when I was 17, uh, which is pretty young, but I started using when I was like 12 or 13. And uh, it sounds really cheesy, but a big part of it was God and believing in something bigger than myself and knowing that um, there's more to life than just me and my problems and putting that weight elsewhere and I haven't used since I was 17 and I have and but just because I haven't used or done anything since I was 17 doesn't mean that I don't struggle every day till this day and it doesn't mean that I don't have moments of weakness and moments of doubt and worry where the first thing that I want to do is snort a line of cocaine do you have um, people or, or um, a structure in place when you do have those moments of doubt, are there people that you turn to? Is do you go to therapy? Um, do you, did you even go to um, an uh, in facility clinic or anything? Yeah, so I did uh, briefly attend like this uh, AA service sort of thing, but I I wasn't consistent with it. Same with therapy, I wasn't consistent with it either because I would go like two or three times and kind of like get this. Um, I don't know how to describe it. This like uh, this life high, and be like, yeah, everything's good, like everything's okay. But then something would happen, and I would get put back into that hole. But I was almost embarrassed to go back. And which like, I think a lot of people struggle with. Like yeah. they often get sober. Um, you know, they might go to meetings, they get sober, and then the first time that they get knocked down and they relapse, they think well, I did it wrong, or there's something wrong with me for having this moment when I think statistically speaking, it can take anywhere from you know, two to 10 times for a lot of right. people to stay clean. Exactly, and I, I mean, I <clears throat> myself don't even know how, like even making it past the first year was difficult, but even those moments of embarrassment, even now to this day, like there's times where, like with my job, where I go to like a certain event, or like if I like, was on a date or like at a bar, and someone would ask me like, for a drink or offer me a drink and I would say no, not to be offensive, but no, I don't want this drink. It immediately I have to like go into this huge explanation of this life story, oh, I was an addict, this happened, this happened. It can't just be like a no. Like people want an explanation for something when you can't just simply say no to say no. And that can be embarrassing as well, like having to sort of relive or revisit this foolishness that you've like were involved in just in a simple setting of like being in a bar or like being in a, at, a, at a house party or something, just to simply be there and hang out and have a good time. And then out of nowhere, you know, someone's like, hey, like, why aren't you holding a red cup? Why aren't yeah. you smoking with us? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, well, something happened to me. I would think that's been <clears throat> a journey for a lot of people is navigating the daily triggers of, it could be a business meeting, it could be a party, it could just be, you know, um, meeting a person for the term drinks, which, right. you know, I used, I don't drink and I still use that term. I'm right. like, I don't drink coffee and I'm like, let's go get coffee. And they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, it hurts my tum tum. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You're like, I don't, I don't, I, right. it's just the thing that we say. But um, would you say now, um, is there a person in your life that you can always go to when you are feeling um, like your foundation is shaky? Um, do you, you, you know, you talk about God being a big part of, um, what helped you get sober? You you told me before the interview that your dad's a pastor. Is yeah, he somebody that you rely he on? He is. I love my dad so much. I love my parents so much. And they are above and beyond. Above and beyond. I feel like I'm going to cry just thinking about <laughs> them because they exceed uh, what it means to be a parent. They just go above and beyond for me. And they're so patient with me because I definitely do have my moments and I have had my moments where I'm just weak and I, I stumble and I'm just falling. 
and uh, they're always there. But I, I, I'll challenge you not to use the word weak. Yeah. Because I think, in, in I think everybody's life, but especially I can only speak from my own, there's moments where I, it's not necessarily that I feel weak, but I feel, I like the word triggered because it's just, just like somebody asking you, why aren't you drinking? And it takes you back to that moment and fills you with embarrassment. I think you have these moments for whatever it is that trigger you and make you feel like, you aren't capable of maintaining the path that you've decided you wanted to go on. And it's less about weakness and more about refocusing. Yeah. And I think there's people in our life that help us refocus and there's people in our life that cause chaos and help us and, and guide us off a path of um, both healing or uh, self-realizing. You bring people in your life that help you feel strong and then there's people in your life that make you doubt yourself. And right. I read an interview with you that I thought was so profound, but you said, um, you talked about your tattoos, and yeah. you said, my modifications have helped me weed out the people in my life that would judge me by my appearance alone so that yeah. they won't distract me in other ways. And I, I, I found that so beautiful because especially since this is for, for younger adults and teenagers, you talk about with your appearance, both with your, your tattoos, but you know, uh, being a black male, being right. a gay male, uh, being somebody that's an activist, uh, thinking about anybody that's a minority, you're able to kind of weed them out immediately because if you're going to judge me by my tattoos or if you're going to judge me by my skin color, then I don't really want to get to know you. Right, yeah. Cause at that point, like, if I'm just meeting you for the first time or just making your acquaintance and you have already discounted what I'm going to say because of how I look, why would I have a conversation with you? And don't you think about that being the base, like that's such, there's such strength in that. Do you feel like that's something that you can always come back to? Which is, is if I'm feeling, like you said, weak at a certain moment, I know that the people in my life right now love me for me. Right, and you know, when I was referencing, you know, weakness and being weak, it wasn't, I don't think it's like, I don't think it's really bad to, to be weak at a time, because it's just like a, uh, I would say like a verbal um, affirmation that I that I can't do things alone and yeah, that I can't I like that um, do things by myself and I think it's important for us to know that we as much as we want to be like our own hero and heroes to people like we need help and we need to do life with people and do things with one another and you know developing that attitude of like. You know, if you don't like the way that I look, then why have a conversation with you? It's, it's, um, I would say it's definitely manifested from years of uh, um, me being ignored and like having conversations with people that lacked depth and that didn't really take me anywhere and protecting my heart from any future kind of harm that I could bring to myself because of the things that people say or because of the things that. Uh, even like it's it's wrong to assume, but sometimes like your heart just knows like yeah. when something is not good for you, absolutely, or like when someone isn't good for you. So it's like I'm not even going to entertain it in the first place to begin with. So when you are feeling weak, who you reach out to your parents? Do you have friends that you've cultivated over time? Who who are your, your like top three go to people that you would? Oh, top three. Yeah. Oh wow. Is it somebody that you met when you were getting clean? Was it somebody that you met because of work? Like, I, I always find, like you said, you, you, you spent a lot of time feeling like you couldn't go deep with people. So yeah. that now you don't waste your time with people that you can't go deep with. So right. I would think the people that you do reach out to when you are feeling your lowest are these rocks in your life yeah I, so i don't i don't want to like list like a three because yeah. i feel so bad because no, 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 there's no. so many people but that are, like, you don't even have to be specific yeah. i think is it like i think some people can here's a good example some people can reach out to their family some people the reason that they are in a bad place is their family right so right. so you're in a very blessed situation where your parents are one of your rocks that you feel like hey i'm i'm not in the best place and these are the reasons why and they're there for you so um I think this goes out to a lot of people that don't have that foundation. Right. So I always find um, the different types of people you meet and how you were able to connect with them really interesting stories because a lot of people just want 
they don't want to have to be vulnerable to have somebody that they can eventually be vulnerable with, but it's usually those vulnerable moments are the way that you initially connect with someone. Right. And sometimes, you know, family doesn't have to be like the like the blueprint of what our society says a family is. Like family could be like your friend in the cafeteria and the dog next door. Like mm -hmm. that could be your family. Like all in one, like your mom, dad, cousin, that could be like all all those people all in one. And <clears throat> whenever like I'm feeling just just not just not good, a big part of like what helps my spirit a lot is going to the shelter. Um, because when I'm there, it's not about me. The and, dog shelter? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's not about me. It's about what what I can do with what I have. And sometimes like. When you think about what you have, especially as a younger person, you feel like you don't have a lot. But when you put yourself in a place where there's a need or like there's a want for affection, conversation, communication, or just care, it helps open up the eyes of your heart a bit to help other people and do something that doesn't necessarily um, cater to you. In moments when I, I can't reach my parents or I can't reach my people. I, I just go and volunteer. And being in that space, uh, even like whenever I'm there, or whenever I go volunteer, they say thank you like a million times just for like giving them a napkin. But I feel like for me, I, I should be thanking them a million times because they're helping yeah. me in more ways than I think that I'm helping them because they're reminding me of what life is. And they're reminding me that there's so much more to my problems than my problems. And being able to do those things um, helps get my train back on the track and um, refocus my vision a bit. Because especially when you're by yourself, like and you're just in your room and <clears throat> you're just going through it, it, it gets really dark, really, really dark. And you feel cornered and you don't really know like if you're gonna make it through the night because of how hard it is and yeah. how tough it is, but going outside and using the bit of time that I have to help somebody else, even for like an hour, kind of changes that whole perspective for me. Even if it changes just for that day, it changed. I love that you talk about being a, a person of service. That's always been the advice um, that I was given that in a, when you're struggling yourself to think outside of yourself and be there for other people. and Beautiful. Often, often it's it's healing and sometimes being a person of service is going over to a friend's place and just doing their dishes yeah you know what i mean you exactly. know they're struggling you're not really sure how to help them and you're like you know what i'll clean your bathroom right let's let's start with something that's manageable for for both of us because i i want to be there for you so i find it um I feel like you opened up like this key that most people don't know about where you're just like, it doesn't always have to be um, the biggest, the biggest, like taking a dog in and just feeding it. Yes. You know what I mean? Like it's, 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 it's instantly rewarding. They're, they're ne never going to not be grateful. Right. Or the fact that you go to homeless shelters or you go to like runaway teen shelters. Yeah. Like, um, are these places that you've ever visited yourself or is this just you have a knowledge of these are people that are in need and I want to help people and animals that are in need? I've been going to shelters and volunteering for, wow, uh, a while, like since I was 18, 19, but in my 20s I've started doing it more and also traveling to other places strictly to volunteer. Um, just because it really is so important to me to uh, take care of people, not just in my community, but outside of my community as well. And with you know the seniors, I had a terrible situation happen to me uh, a few years ago where I was spit on by an elderly woman hmm. who told me that I was gonna burn in hell. Ooh, can I say hell? Yeah. Okay. She told me I was gonna burn in hell um, because I'm tattooed and I, as you're helping her. As I'm helping her. Yeah. And so I kind of just um, have developed this way of turning like every negative situation into something that I can use for good. And so I started going to more senior centers and just put it in my mind that, you know, I don't know if they would ever be exposed to someone who looks like me. And so why wouldn't I 
go here and help and serve them and be a servant to them, um, just to give them a different idea of what they think that I'm supposed to be. Um, which is really sad that we even have to have this idea of like how we think someone's gonna act towards us based on how they look. Um, but I mean, it's, just, it's the society in which we live and I have fallen victim to it many times. With that, helping with seniors, um, it has turned into something so much greater than what it originally was. And I have so much love for them and uh, so much care for them. And they make me feel so good um, just by saying, hey, and some of them have like, like issues with their memory and they don't remember things like a lot of times. So whenever I do go, I'm like reintroducing myself, but every time it's so lovely because um, yeah. they, they're just so happy that someone is there. And with the teens that I get the chance. they think like 15 tattoo guys are just the nicest people they've ever met. <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> all 27 of them. And like with, um, with the teens, it's so important for younger queer kids to see a queer adult who survived. Absolutely. And to see a queer adult who um, is making things work, whatever that means for them. Because a lot of times there are certain teens who are sex workers and certain teens who are, have run away from home and you know, no one is looking for them. Which makes me so sad because I, I understand and I don't understand you know, a parent or an adult being frustrated, confused, upset even about their child's sexuality. But if you take away the word sexuality, I mean, it's just a child. And why, like, why would any kid make the decision to leave their home, leave their bedroom, meals, internet, <laughs> like to live on the street because they're telling you that they're gay? Why, like, why would someone lie about this? I don't understand. Like, and it, it gets me passionately angry because of the fact that, you know, these kids have so much passion and they're so driven and they know what they want to do, but because of this one thing that they've been made to believe is like a disease or a curse, they're on the street or they're in the shelter or they're in the center or whatever the case may be. And going there and hanging out, and sometimes like, you know, we, we do fashion shows for them or we get them eyelashes or we just go and hang out for the day. And um, they have so much potential and so much light in them. And I feel bad for their parents. Cause I'm like, wow, like you're missing out on missing, like this beautiful creature that you made because you know, you are so delayed and confused and stuck in a way. And you know, it's, it's really sad that, you know, those kids don't have a quote unquote like house, but when we're there, like we have a home with each other and um, they, they mean so much to me and they're so funny, <laughs> so funny. I love that you're, you're both able to create a community and um, a connection with people um, to let them know that there is a life outside of this kind of ultimate rejection your yeah. family rejecting you you know is the foundation of how you're going to perceive other people right you know the the love that you receive the love or lack of love you receive right at a young age determines how you um connect for the rest of your life and so what you're saying is you know while this is heartbreaking that you don't have this foundation that should just be a given you can develop it outside of that and you shouldn't let this first rejection right. determine how you treat others how you treat yourself which like you said as be people um, becoming sex workers people doing drugs um, right. you know if they're uh, participating in crime whatever they're doing that might be self-harming or harming a community you tell them that there's actually a life outside of that where you don't have to lessen yourself to, right. to feel connected or to feel loved and that right. you should be loved now. And it's also important as, you know, an outside adult to not be another voice that's telling them what to do. Yeah. Because whenever I get the chance to be around any students or any kids and hang out, I just always make it clear that there's an option. Like there's an option. Cause you know, I'm not telling like, cause if you are working as a sex worker and you're 15, 16 years old and you know, this is how you, get your dinner every night, you're like, I can't just, I'm, I can't just come in and be like, stop doing this right yeah, now, immediately. You know, I, but I can come in and say like, hey, like, I care about you and 
I just want you to be safe, you know? Yeah. And, to and take if care I can help you give, give you other options, or right. to let you know that there are other options, I would like to be that person. Exactly, and I feel like that's the hardest thing is that most of the time, people do not see the options or they don't feel like they have a choice to do something else. And plus when you're young, like, you feel like you're gonna be the same age for 10 years. When I was 15, I feel like I was gonna be 15 for the rest of my life. Cause it was just, uh, it was just one thing after another. And I was like, do I have a birthday this year? Like what's going on? And you know, for now imagine that, but then put yourself like, you know, on the street. It's and every like, day feels so much longer. And every day it feels like a month, you know? So being able to step in and whether it's like six hours a day or 12 hours a week and kind of just, you know, put them in a different reality just for a little bit of time, I feel like it'll do some good and uh, hopefully, you know, light some fires in them to let them know that like someone's got their back. So my understanding from doing research about you is the way that you kind of take care of yourself is you, you've always journaled from a very young yeah. age, which has turned into your music. Yeah. Um, you work out. A and lot. You're, you're yeah. very much, um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about that before we talk about journaling, but just yeah. the fact that you started working out as a way to kind of numb. Yes. But then it's now turned into like a bigger passion and something that kind of restarts you every day. Can you yeah. talk about how working out has been? Yeah, so I was in the swim team in high school and um, I was also an addict all throughout high school, so it was very interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as I, the, when I first got clean, I needed a vice. I needed something to do when I was like, just, just like geeking out and needed like to use. So I would go for really long runs, really long, like cross country. I, I would go. And after that, it kind of just like, <clears throat> I was getting tired. Cause I have like a pretty like addictive personality. If I do something once, I have to do it a million times. And after a million times, I'm like, okay, I'm ready for a second million times or something else. And so I started uh, just like doing a lot of cardio stuff and lifting in my garage and then started going to the gym regularly. And when I got accepted to college, when I moved, I got a gym membership and kind of was just waking up at 6 a.m. every day and going to the gym. And, I, and the gym was like a pretty good distance, but I bought a bike and I would ride my bike to the gym, work out, and then bike back, just to have my body constantly moving and doing something. Because especially within the first year of me getting clean, I was like, okay, Eve's like, we need to find something. We need to do something that, you know, gets our mind going and like gets us, gets our, our blood like moving that's not harmful to us. And so, yeah, and I, now I still go work out all the time and it's, such a good, like, centering time. Is centering a word? It is now. Wow, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good, like, centering time for me to kind of just put all my thoughts in one place and get something done. And my favorite part about working out isn't the beginning or the end, it's the middle part. Because when you first start working out, like, in the beginning, you're just like, okay, like, you know, I got a playlist going, like, we're here, da 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 And the very end of it, you're just like, wow, like, we did it. But the part of the middle is just like, can I do this? I'm sweating so bad. My legs hurt, my arms hurt. Are we gonna make it? And that's my favorite part because it kind of, like, pushes me to go further and same like in life, whenever things are just not good, I'm like, are we gonna make it? And then we get to the end of it and I'm like, okay, like we made it. So every day you have something that's strictly for yourself. Yeah. And it both, it's both calming and meditative, but also challenging and, yeah. and helps you continually push yourself, but also believe in yourself. Right. Like these little baby moments where you're just like, hey, we got through a workout, we can get through anything. Exactly. So working out is, a extremely important for your for your mental health yes um, and also this is once a month I go on a self date and I get really dressed up I put my phone on airplane mode I take myself out to dinner really nice dinner and a movie with a large popcorn and a large soda because yeah. it's just me yeah of course and I just sit and it's the most calming time it's just so good and I talk to myself. And there's been times where I've like made a reservation for one, which is I'm the one. Yeah. And I'm sitting and uh, a host will come and see me like, are you waiting for someone? Or like, 
Do you want to wait and have some, some roles before the person you're waiting for arrives? And I just love being able to say, like, it's just me. Yeah. Like, I'm just, uh, this is the date. Like, it's just me. And I, I love it so much. And I'm, like, talking to him. I like a crazy person. But I love it because I'm talking, I'm like, okay, so, like, what are we doing, like, next month? What are our summer plans? And it's just this time I get to have alone and just be with myself and hear my heartbeat like in my ear and like hear myself breathe and know that like I'm a living, breathing person who's capable of doing things. And taking myself out on this date, like intentionally, is making that time. It's not like someone canceled their plans and I can't hang out with them. It's not like I don't have a show to walk in today. It's, hey, today is my day and we're going out on a date and it's gonna be good. I like self-date. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. I also find it uh, adorable as, as somebody that is a model that most people leave you, you dress up for other people. Right. But I mean, I think women have been saying it for years. We dress for ourselves. You know, if you like it, good for you. But, exactly. You know, like that's right. why heels being comfortable is important because you're not wearing them. I am. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I love the idea that you dress for yourself, something that makes you feel beautiful. Yeah. And then you take yourself somewhere that you want to go. I right. think a lot of people are constantly chasing the approval for others and as somebody exactly. that is in the public eye that must be something that you struggle with as well yeah but here you have this day once a month which I think is if you can fit in I mean you fit in so much with all your volunteering and your work but if you can fit in lunch with a friend you can fit in lunch, lunch with, with yourself, yourself. Yeah. yeah I love exactly. that I want to talk about journaling um, uh, when therapy isn't accessible to mm -hmm. many people or it's still foreign or stressful or um, you're just not ready, I think journaling is the best thing you can do, anybody can do, I mean. Absolutely. Um, when did you start journaling? Um, do you still journal today? Yes. Um, I started journaling when I was pretty young. So I learned to write in cursive when I was in the second grade, and I love the way it looks. And so I just like, <clears throat> any chance I've had, I had to write when I was young, I would always take it and just write. And <clears throat> I started just putting my feelings down because when I was younger and a little bit older as a teen, I was immensely bullied. I was a, I was a shorter kid. I was very quiet. It's very strange. I was just weird and kind of like in my own in my own thing. I was the only black kid on the baseball team. I didn't really speak to people um, because I was just a, I was nervous and I was shy all the time and I didn't really think anyone cared about what I had to say. So I was like, I might as well just not say. And so I would just write stuff um, in my notebooks, in the back of like my planners. And in my school, we had these like planners that you had like to log in when you would use the bathroom as like a hall pass. But I would be scared to go in the hallways alone. So I would just write different things like in the planners and like words that rhymed. And as I got older, by older I mean like 10, 11, 12, I started to like really write and jot down things that were bothering me and write down things that I wish could change around me and things that I want to change and things that I want to do. And it's so interesting for me to look at notebooks that I journaled in when I was an addict and to read like journals now. It's like two separate like like energies but occupying the same vessel because I still see parts of myself in like my old journals but I see like like cuts of like my new self trying to like come out of my old self in those journals and when I read like new stuff that I'm writing about and things that I put in my journal I see bits of my old self that haven't healed because there's like parts of my childhood and parts of me as a teen that were never addressed, that are still like healthy, but like not in a good way, which like channels into the reason why like I struggle with depression and the reason why it affects me so much because those moments and those trials were um, never, ten never tended to or uh, taken care of, but being able to journal somehow, some way, it, like I see the journal as a person, and I'm able to like put these words on this person that's not me, 
and um, which is essentially what therapy is. Right, exactly. It is being able to express your true self and not only have it be reflected back to you, but I think often a good therapist is able to say, I see you, right. I understand you, and I think X, Y, and Z feelings are coming from this thing that happened when you were nine. Right. Or have you noticed that you talk about this over and over again and really this stems from this one moment that happened on the baseball, you right. know, the baseball field when you were 15. Right. So I, I find it beautiful that you say this journal is like a person because I think some people aren't ready to talk to a person. I think some right. people can't afford to talk to a person or some people have no people. Like when you were younger, right. you felt like there was nobody that you could honestly and openly be yourself and you started with paper. Right. And you know, sometimes I love what you just said about like, you know, some people don't have a person and some people can't afford a person because I get messages constantly from different people like everywhere who are struggling or having a hard time and just really, it's, it's just like they're, they're not happy. They're going through it. And something that I always try to say, I'm like, you know, if you can write something down, write it down. And it sounds like, and I never want to sound like you're pawning someone off to something, but it, like, it really does work for me. But, and I also know that just because it works for me, it may not work for you or the person next to me, but it's, it's just worth a try, you know? And it, it can be hard to even try sometimes. Um, but doing like those different things and finding these outlets that are healthy, whether it's like the self dates or working out or journaling, these are things that I have found that, that, that help me and do help me and like, <clears throat> allow me to, for the moment, kind of sweat out what I'm going through and let out like what I'm dealing with. Even though like, you know, I can respectfully and confidently say to you and all of everyone here, there are certain things that I will never talk about, ever. Because I just, it's just so hard for me. There's just certain things that I, I... But do you feel like you're saying ever because you're 25 and like you yeah. said, you do struggle with depression and often there are times that things get triggered and you're just not ready to... Yeah. And I, you know, and when I say ever, I mean, of course, like, you know, uh, there are parts of me that are tattooed that I said this is never going to happen and now they're tattooed. <laughs> <laughs> so like, but... You're ready to eat your words at any <laughs> Right, <time. laughs> exactly. So, you know, like, definitely... Um, but, but I think there's something... I, I think it's definitely okay to say I'm not ready to tackle this right yeah. now. Yeah. And I also feel like as like as a person you're like a i know you're like this beautiful like treasure chest and you know you want to share your treasure but you know you want to have you know like at least keep a gold coin to for you so you can survive the rest of your life and like you know i have like a few gold coins that um are things that i <clears throat> have like put in a room in my head um cuz it's not it's not safe for them to occupy this home and I, I just don't talk about them. And, but maybe like, you know, anything is possible. And, <laughs> and things change and things happen. But yeah, as far as now, like there are certain things that I have seen and unfortunately done that I will never discuss. But I know that's a part of me healing and I know that's a part of uh, my growing. And that's the beautiful part about being alive is that I, you never stop growing. When I was 15 years old, tried to take my own life, and at the time, it was all that I myself personally had control over, and it was the only thing that made sense to me because I felt like I was a waste of space and that uh, I wouldn't be missed. For, for Man Crush Monday on social media, you utilize it by sharing stories of people that died of suicide. Um, what do you hope by giving um, these recently passed people a voice? What is your, your goal with sharing their story? I definitely don't want people of any age or background to think that you, know, you have to die to be heard. I don't want people to think that you have to die to finally be listened to. And the message is more so to do the opposite, is to show that like people 
are dying because they're not being heard. So while we're here, listen to each other, talk to one another, and your voice matters here right now. And um, I know it's like it's intense to talk about those deaths and, and it's no way, shape or form trying to glorify them or um, celebrate the fact that this has happened in any way, capacity or form. Um, but the message behind it is to let people know that, you know, you can speak up right now. You can be heard right now. You don't have to, you know, make this choice. And it affects everyone. Right, exactly. Like, I think the, the diversity of ages and ethnicities and backgrounds show that this is a people problem. People problem. And not a, a small community problem. Right, I mean, you know, people, like, kids as young as five and adults who are 60, you know, it could happen to anyone, and, and kind of like you know, showing this range of ages and backgrounds and different walks of life lets people know also that it's not just them. You're not the only person who's struggling with this. You're not by yourself in this. Yeah. And sometimes, like, it can be very, very, very easy to you know sit in that feeling of like I'm by myself, I'm alone. It's just me. And these posts, you know kind of give like arms and legs and a head to that feeling where it's like, no, like another person was suffering with this as well, or going through this as well. And you can talk about this now, like while you're here with me. I like that. Who do you hope to uh, reach or inspire with uh, sharing your story with us today? I hope to reach and inspire not only the youth, but adults as well. Um, because there's already so much pressure put on kids it's like to be more than just kids. And sometimes that pressure is put on um, by adults. And also sometimes like the lack of adult presence um, creates, you know, these unfortunate um, situations or um, different outcomes that could have been avoided if um, people were being paid attention to more. So I would hope to just let people know that, you know, if you're hurt or if you've been hurt before, that hurt can stop with you. You don't have to hurt other folks or treat people bad because someone has treated you badly. Don't take it out on people who are trying just like you to make it through every day. Even getting out of your bed is I think, something to be celebrated. I wish they had Grammys for getting out of your bed <laughs> because just going outside is hard. Yeah. So, you know, just <clears throat> go easy on each other, but go easy on yourself and also take care of each other um, because life is really, really hard and really difficult. And, but it's also beautiful. And there are gonna be times where, you know, you just need someone and you can't do it all on your own. And in those moments where is when you should like cling to people and anyone who you would consider a friend, even slightly, um, instead of clinging to something that could potentially harm you or hurt you. And um, yeah, and also, let's not wait for people to die to care about them. Because we're here right now, and we matter. Sadly, I think very much in America, in our society, if you aren't visible the way we would like you to be visible, we start to ignore you. Homeless people, right. ignored. Um, if anybody is an addict, we ignore. Anybody that seems problematic or, or like you kind of said earlier, has this unseen burden, we, right. we ignore. And I feel like you specifically go after the people that are being ignored and say, yeah. hey, I see you. Which I think um, is beyond important and I think in a lot of ways is like we talked about earlier, how you're healing, which is I, was, I wasn't I was seen, but I'm gonna go see those people and find their humanity. Right. Because I would like somebody to see my humanity and wish they saw my humanity at nine, and I would like them to see my humanity at 25. Exactly. I, I, I love how you, you, you talk about this space and it's all about helping other people. Um, how do you like being helped? When you are depressed or you had a bad day or you're, you're struggling with your sobriety, 
how do you want to be taken care of? Because you talk about taking care of other people, which is right. beautiful and important, and you talk about these self-dates. Again, taking care of yourself is important. Right. But you, you create a community for other people. What is your community doing for you? This is such a beautiful question, especially like, what, what, like helping other people, because this is actually a personal struggle of mine like when it comes to um, helping myself because I don't like people worrying about me. And I don't like people uh, asking me what I need because I just want to like, I just want to give. I don't really want anything. I don't need anything. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm so content. And so I always want to like give stuff to people so whenever even like around like holidays or birthdays when my family asks me what I would like or there's something I want, I'm like, I don't know, like a pizza? <laughs> like, <laughs> cause I don't like, there's nothing that I want. Um, but a beautiful way that I've noticed my community uh, give back to me is like, I, it's like hard to explain like in a library of words, books. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they just, they support me in a, like, in a very verbal way. And like words of affirmation uh, really um, like boost me. And really like, just like having these talks with my friends and having talks with people. I love talking to people, but I also really love hearing people talk. Yeah. And um, those are, like this, like the simple ways that I, like I would say my, com my community helps me. It's just those conversations and people sharing their truth with me. So you talked about being bullied when you were younger. Yeah. Um, how were you bullied? And, and I, I mean, I feel like some ways we covered this, but you, you were bullied where, when you were younger and you're constantly going into environments where people have either suffered from being bullied mm -hmm. or, they're, or just in general, how our community kind of bullies people. Right. Um, what are your hopes for with teenagers today um, and, and even just the anti-bullying campaigns and, right. and, and what they're trying to show people and how it affects them? Well, this um, particular topic is so interesting because as much as we would like to believe that having these programs and different things that can go into a school setting and talk about bullying and address it and bring it up. Like, it's, it's so, so difficult. It's so difficult because even I've had moments where I'll go speak at a school or like go hang out with some kids and I won't go there for like two months and then I come back and then like, there's a child there who took their own life from bullying. And bullying doesn't just happen at school. It happens in your house, it happens in your community, and it's one of the faults, one of the many faults is that whenever someone comes forth or says something, like it's not taken seriously until someone dies. And then they're like, okay, maybe we should bring in this program to come and do this thing. Or, like, or often it's not labeled as bullying. Right, exactly. They're just like, oh, he was struggling with this, da, da, da. it's like, no, like people were belittling him, yeah. mocking him, and making him feel small. And sometimes it's your own people, yeah. which to me, like, makes me even more upset, especially like as a person of color. Like when it, when it comes to blackness and mental health, it's not taken seriously sometimes in the black community. It's almost to the point where it's like, oh, like you're already black, why would you do this to yourself? But it's like, no, like black people can be depressed too. <laughs> like, like people can, anyone can struggle with anything. And you know, if you're living in a certain community, household, neighborhood, and you're going through this, like, why would you bring it up if no one's taking it seriously? Like, why would you talk about it if no one's gonna, like, take what you're saying into consideration? This is a form of telling somebody that they're not capable or they're not right or they aren't um, allowed to do something. And it is a form of bullying and it starts everything from saying, you don't look a certain way, so we're not gonna like you. Exactly. Or you're acting weird and we don't like that and we're gonna ostracize you. And it goes all the way up to the top saying that you don't have autonomy over your life and your body. Right, when I was bullied, I remember going to my guidance counselor and my gym teacher and I was like, these kids are gonna kill me. You have to stop them. Oh, they're just boys, you're a freshman. It's okay, like, play basketball with them. 
I cannot play with them. They won't pick me. Yeah. It's like, it's, can I just clean something in the locker room? Can I sit in the stands? Like, I just don't want to be next to them. Like, I don't just, I don't want to be here. And it's not, like, no one ever thinks that you're being serious. And they think that it's a joke or just like, oh, these are kids. But kids hurt people too. Yeah. And, like, and when you're dismissive, if the first time someone uses their voice, you dismiss them, what's going to, it's going to be so much harder to use it a second or a third time. Exactly. So the first time somebody says, hey, this is a problem and it's causing X and Y feelings. Right. And you say you're wrong or we don't believe you. Why would they ever go and say when it gets even ser more serious internally right. or externally? Exactly. It's like why? Like why? I was like so, so tired of having to explain my pain, and to explain what I was going through and not being believed. And so yeah, I I tried to kill myself because I was like, this is like, it's just too much, and I I I can't deal with this, and that's why I. I take bullying so seriously in any capacity and in any way. And even as an adult now, I deal just because of the way that I am and like the way that I carry myself and how much I love myself, I deal with cyberbullying all the time. And also in person too. Like I've been approached before by parents whose kids follow me um, on social media and they're like, you know, like I think you're making my son gay. <sighs> I'm like, well. Um, That's not how it works. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, um, you know, if your son is gay, he's probably gay. Yeah. So go love your gay son. Which is also really sad because if they actually took a deep dive into your social media, what you're doing is actually just showing other people's voices and, exactly. and putting out probably the most thoughtful vibes of taking care of a community. Right. You, you said earlier that um, in the black community, going to therapy, um, um, uh, being open about your feelings, uh, connecting with others is, is very rare and it's, um, I've actually not only read about it, but um, Daryl from Run DMC, DMC from yes. Run DMC, he came out with a book called um, um, 10 Ways Not to Commit Suicide. And I read it, it was a, it beautifully written, but I also, because of the Jed Foundation, heard him talk and he, now what he does in his, his spare time is he goes to a lot of um, black male youth groups and, right. and, and schools and he talks to them about the importance of uh, taking care of your mental health, the importance of therapy, which is what saved his life. Even at the peak of his career, um, he was the most depressed he'd ever been. And I yeah. think a lot, of, a lot of people in general, but specifically people um, that believe that success and money are gonna change how they feel about themselves on the inside, he was able to say, at the pinnacle of my career in hip hop, right. I felt the worst I've ever felt. And I had to uh, seek therapy and, and other resources to feel better. And in the black community, especially males, yes. are, they have even less resources and the stigma of opening up, right. expressing yourself and using a resource like therapy is so frowned upon. Right, and what's so sad about that, I had this interview with uh, this magazine a few years ago called Idol Magazine. And in the magazine they asked me like, why do I feel that people are so um, disrespectful towards feminine gay black men? And my take on it pretty much was that like, in general, like, women aren't respected. Anything feminine-like, female-like, isn't respected or um, taken seriously. And it's so sad that, like, a lot of times in, like, especially like in hyper-masculine communities, they associate, like, talking about your feelings and sharing your emotions as being, they correlate that with being a woman or like being feminine or like being weak. And their idea of like sharing these things or talking about yourself like in a way of like seeking help is seen as a, like being like not strong enough to handle life or to handle the, the realities of life. And the reason why like that bothers me for a multitude of reasons is because it's that very attitude and energy that creates these like these crimes and creates these stories and these lives that we don't hear about. It's that kind of attitude um, that creates 
like the staggering number of deaths for black trans women. It's that attitude that creates this like disgusting way of living that you decide to bully, disrespect, and mock anything that's not like you or anything at all that you don't agree with or understand. Your first reaction is to um, hate it and to hide it. Hide it, exactly. It's so scary that, you know, like even like as we're having this conversation right now and talking about it, like right now, like someone is just, someone is going to die, like because of that, because of that attitude. Well, hurt people hurt people. Right. I think bullying comes, whether it comes from the child feeling bullied in their home or feeling right. hurt or misunderstood, or the fact that a parent has felt that way and this is how they behave and it seems right. normal. This toxic masculinity, this belief that um, keeping all your pain inside um, that you should be able to hold it and nobody needs to help you or take care of you. Right. That, um, that you're seen as weak. And I, I, I very much agree that the uh, feminine energy has always been looked down upon. Absolutely. It's why I think a lot of people are against gay men. Because yes. It's, I don't, you know, and this might be overstepping a boundary, but is it really about the sexuality or is it about the fact that they're not in the box of what a man should be? Exactly. And I've, because I've had many moments of disagreements and um, aggressive conversations with people about it. And, and a lot of times, too, when people like make fun of something or they joke at it, it's because it's not their version of what they want that thing to be. Yeah. And I, I did a shoot on in November, and it came out on Thanksgiving. And I'm wearing a skirt, and it looks great, and it feels good. It was easy to use the bathroom that day. It's just great. And my legs are tattooed. My whole body's tattooed. And so it was posted online, and you know the uh, the remarks about it are absolutely insane. But what like the the reason why I was so bothered is because most of it was from black people, and I just. I'm like, okay, look, y'all, like, what have we been through? <laughs> what are we going through? But yet, we're still here to knock down our own people. Yeah. There are so many more things going on besides my tattooed thighs being in a skirt. Yeah. That your attention They're needs. trying to take away our rights. Our rights. <laughs> our rights. There's so much going on, but this is where your energy is at, and that's when I get angry. Yeah. Because I'm just like, wow, like this, like there's so much more that you could be doing with this. Why do you care about me? Like there's so much more that could be that you could be using this energy for um, to help people, to to lift us up, to do more for us, and specifically when it comes to men, um, in any facet, um, I just I have to remind myself to not bring myself to that level of anger whenever I'm talking to them or having that conversation. Because it's so easy to get angry because you want, you want someone to see things the way that you do, but that's impossible. And you want someone to like, be in your mind and be like, this is the way like, I see out of my glasses and this is how it looks for me. But there's also this incredible weight of like, um, possible shame that is placed on them because like people feel ashamed to talk about things, people feel embarrassed to talk about things, or they don't feel comfortable talking about these things. So the moment they start to open their mouth and speak about how they really feel, then people they fear people would be like, oh, wait, are you gay? Or did it? And it's like no, like they're just sharing their feelings. Like you can share your feelings and not be gay, you know. But some people like they they're only used to one kind of way that things are supposed to be. And I love being like just one example of how you can present one way and occupy a multitude of different roads, paths, and different cars. I mean, I think you do it beautifully. I'm so grateful that you took the time to talk to us because I think everything that you express with how you live your life and just how you talk shows people that you can be like a force of good. Oh, I try my best. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Oh, tell me why.